This is the second lesson in ICS Fluid Flow. Page 103, problem number 4. The pressure is 25 feet of water and flow velocity is 100 feet per second in a 2 inch ID pipe. The pipe widens to 28 inches ID and rises 5 feet from its original level. Calculate the pressure in PSI in the elevated and enlarged section of pipe. Answer in PSI. I've drawn a little picture here. We'll fill in the information and solve it. We're told that P, and I'll call this 1 and call this 2. There's no orifice here. It's just pipe. I'll call this P1 is 25 feet of water and velocity 1 is given as 100 feet per second and the diameter of the pipe D1 is 2 inches and the elevation well it's not given but the lowest elevation is always counted as zero. In the elevated section of pipe we're asked to calculate P2 ultimately in PSI. V2 well, we're going to have to calculate that from V1 and the pipe diameters. D2 is given as 28 inches. That's quite a widening from 2 inches to 28 inches and the elevation says it's five feet above the lower elevation. Let's write down Bernoulli's equation and then we'll fill in whatever we have and whatever we need. I have pressure one plus rho g z one, that's the elevational potential energy, plus one half rho v one squared that's the total mechanical energy on the left side is equal to P2 plus rho g z2 plus one half rho v2 squared. We're asked to solve for P2 ultimately in PSI but we'll have to use the units in the expression and then we'll convert to PSI later. So the pressure here is given as 25 feet of water. We can't put that directly in the equation. That's not the units of the equation. This form of the equation uses pressure, so we're either going to be newtons per square meter if it's SI, dynes per square centimeter if we go CGS, or pounds per square foot if it's British. And I'm seeing numbers in feet per second and such, so I'm going to go with the British system. So the pressure will have to be in pounds per square foot. So let's convert the pressure. 25 feet of water We'll use atmospheric pressure as a conversion factor. There's 33.90 feet of water. It has the same as 2,116 pounds per square foot. And that's 1561 pounds per square foot. And that's P1. Now we'll need to get velocity 2. We have V1 is 100 feet per second. We need V2. I have it written here as 0.5 feet per second. Where does that come from? Well, the diameter increases by a factor of well, 14 times from 2 inches up to 28 inches. So that'll cause a huge drop in velocity. So V2 will be V1 times the ratio of diameter squared. Again, V2 will be smaller. That'll be V1, 100 feet per second, times, I need to make this smaller, 
put the small number over the big number that'll be 2 inches over 28 inches and we square that ouch that's really small when you square 2 over 28 is 07 squared is 005 005 times 100 actually works out to be 0 0.51 feet per second so that's quite a drop in velocity we can put this in the equation now we have P1 is 1561 pounds per square foot. Then we have rho GZ1, well elevation 1 was 0 so that just becomes 0 pounds per square feet. 1 half rho V1 squared and in the British system the mass density is 1.9403 slugs per cubic foot and then V1 is 100 feet per second and that's squared. That'll be equal to P2 which we're hoping to solve for plus rho GZ2 again that'll be 1.9403 slugs per cubic foot times the gravitational constant is 32.17 pounds per slug and times the elevation 2 which is 5 feet plus 1 half rho 1.9403 slugs per cubic foot times V2 squared. Well V2 we said was 0 0.51 feet per second and we have to square that. Alright so let's work these out and see what we have. I have 1561 pounds per square foot plus zero pounds per square foot. This term one half times 1.9403 times 100 squared works out to be 9700 pounds per square foot. That's equal to P2 plus this term 1.9403 times 32.17 times 5 for that I get 312 pounds per square foot. And the last term here, 0.5 squared is 0 0.25 uh, divided by 2 and then multiplied by 2. Uh, it's very small, it's about 0 0.25 pounds per square foot. When you consider the magnitude of the other values, this one's nearly 10,000 over here, this 0.25 is pretty much negligible. So collecting our terms, we have P2 is equal to 9,700 pounds per square foot plus 1561, subtract 312 pounds per square foot. And totaling those, I get P2 is equal to 10,000 950 pounds per square foot. Now I want that in PSI so I need to convert per square feet to per square inches. And If you recall that uh, one foot is equal to 12 inches we only, we only need to square that and see that there's 144 square inches in a square foot. So we're going to divide by 144 and we wind up with 76.0 pounds per square inch or PSI. So that is P2. Pretty tedious, isn't it?
So in this form of Bernoulli's equation, all the terms had units of pressure, in this case in the British system, pounds per square foot. But you'd be glad to know that we can use a simpler form of Bernoulli's equation. We'll do this again much more simply if we use the form H1, that's pressure as height of a fluid, plus Z1, the elevation, again in height, and then plus V1 squared over 2G is equal to H2, that's pressure 2, we're trying to solve for that, plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G. So recall that the pressure H1 in height was 25 feet, elevation 1 was 0, V1 squared over 2G, that would be 100 feet per second, that's squared, over 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared. Notice again the units cancel and become feet or height. That's equal to H2. Elevation 2 was 5 feet. And then the second term here, well, it's really, really small, right? V2 was, recall, this was 0 0.51 feet per second. And then we're going to square that, that's 0.25, and divide it by 64. It really is negligible. We're just going to count it as 0. So collecting our terms, let's see, 20 5 feet plus 0 feet. Now this term 100 squared over 64.4 that works out to be 155 feet equals H2 plus 5 feet. You can see from this that H2 will be equal to 155 plus 25 minus 5 or 155 plus 20 is 175 feet of water. And we simply need to convert that to PSI. Again, we can use atmospheric pressure. There's 14.70 PSI, that's atmospheric pressure, and so is 33.90 feet of fresh water. And that works out to be 75.9 PSI which is pretty much the same as we got by the other formula, but this one's just a lot easier to use. Still on page 103, let's try problem number 5. Water flows in a pipe in a direction from A to B at a rate of 8.50 cubic meters per minute. That's a flow rate, that's not a velocity. We'll have to calculate a velocity from that. The diameter at A is 30.4 centimeters and at B it's 15.2 centimeters. That's a factor of 2, right? The pressure at A is 1.03 times 10 to the 5 pascals, newtons per square meter. Calculate the pressure at B in pascals if the center at B is 60.4 centimeters lower than the center at A. Okay, I've drawn a picture. Let's label it up. Diameter 1 is 30.4 centimeters. Diameter 2 is half of that. It's 15.2 centimeters. Pressure 1 is given as 1.03 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter or pascals. P2 is what we're trying to solve for. Elevation 1 it says it's 60.4 centimeters lower at B which means A is 60.4 centimeters higher and 60.4 centimeters is 0.604 meters and the lower elevation is always set to zero. Now V1 we don't know and we don't know V2 but we're given a flow rate and we have a pipe diameter we should be able to work out these velocities. 
Yeah, that's all we need. Q is equal to 8.5 cubic meters per minute. We always want to work in per second. And we know that Q is equal to V times A. Really what we need is velocity, so V will be equal to Q over A. Let's convert 8.5 cubic meters per minute to cubic meters per second. We'll be dividing by 60, right? 60 seconds in a minute. And for that, I get 0 0.1417 cubic meters per second. Now the area is pi d squared over 4. I'm going to be working in the SI system, so I need everything in meters. So the diameter, you can choose either diameter at A or B. I'm going to use the one on the left. It's 0.304 meters. It's 30.4 centimeters. But as a in meters, that's 0 0.304 meters squared over 4. And for that, I get 0. 0726 square meters area. And notice the units when you divide cubic meters per second by square meters you get meters per second which is velocity and that works out to be 1.952 I'm carrying an extra sig fig here meters per second. Now that I used the diameter at point A on the left so this will be V1 if you will Let me label that. There's the diameter, 30.4. V1 is 1.95. I'll carry the X1 for now, meters per second. So I need V2. Now will V2 be larger or smaller than V1? The pipe is constricting at B, so V2 must be greater than V1. So let's make it get larger by with a ratio of diameter squared. This was V1, so V2 will be equal to V1 times the ratio of diameters squared. V1 is 1.952 meters per second. What are my diameters? They're 15.2 and 30.4. Okay, so it's a ratio of 2 to 1, and it's getting larger. I'm going to put the larger number over the small number, 30.4 centimeters divided by 15.2 centimeters. That's a factor of 2 and it's squared so it's a factor of 4 times. 4 times 1.952 works out to be 7.81 meters per second. Alright, so that's V2. We're all set to put all our values in Bernoulli's equation. We'll do it both ways again. See which one you like more. See which one is your favorite. P1 plus rho g z1 plus one half rho v1 squared is equal to P2 plus rho g z2 plus one half rho v2 squared. You're not expected to memorize these equations. They'll be given to you on the test, so don't fret about that. All right, so P1 is going to be 1.03 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter. In this form of Bernoulli's equation, all terms have units of pressure. In the SI system, that's pascals or newtons per square meter. All right, we need rho. That's the mass density of water in the SI system. It's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. G in the SI system is 9.807 newtons per kilogram. And the elevation 
at point one is 0 0.604 meters above elevation at B. Plus our velocity term, this is one half times rho, which again is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And V1 we said was 1.952 meters per second, and that term is squared. All right, on the right-hand side we have P2, which we're solving for, and then elevation 2 is 0, so that'll be our 0 term. And then we have 1 half rho v squared again, so that's 1 half rho is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter for water, and the velocity is 7.81 meters per second and that term is squared. Let's work out the terms and we'll combine them together. This is 1.03 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter plus this next term works out to be 59.23 newtons per square meter. Notice the units all have to be the same. Plus 19.05 newtons per square meter is equal to P2 plus 0 plus 30,500 newtons per square meter. So if I collect these terms, I'll have P2 is equal to 1905 plus 5923 plus 1.03 times 10 to the 5 minus 30,500 and that works out to be 8.03 times 10 to the 4 newtons per square meter or pascals. And that's it. Alright, was that fun? Well, maybe not, but I think it's straightforward. Let's calculate it one more time using the other form of Bernoulli's equation. I'll try a different color here just to keep them separate. H1 plus Z1 plus V1 squared over 2G is equal to H2 plus Z2 plus V2 squared over 2G. Now in this form of Bernoulli's equation, every term has to have units of height. In the SI system, it'll be meters. We need to convert the pressure of 1.05 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter to a height. Let me write it over here. 1.03 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter as a height of water. We'll use atmospheric pressure again. There are 10.33 meters of water is equal to atmospheric pressure and so is 1.01325 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter or pascals. And for this I get oh, just slightly more, 10.53 meters of water. That's the pressure term at point A. So I have 10.53 meters. Elevation number 1 is given as 60.4 centimeters. In meters that's 0.604 meters. We have velocity 1 squared over 2g, that's 1.95 meters per second squared over 2 times g. Now g is 9.807 meters per second squared. Look at the units here. We have in the numerator meters squared divided by second squared. In the denominator we have meters divided by second squared. So when you cancel this, all that's left is meters and that's what we need. H2 plus 0 elevation plus V2 squared, that's 7.81 meters per second squared divided by 2 times 9.81 meters per second squared almost there. 10.53 meters plus 0.604 meters. 
this term evaluates to be 0 0.19 meters equals h2 plus 0 plus and over here we have 3.11 meters of water. If I combine all these together I get h2 is equal to 0 0.19 plus 0 0.604 plus 10.53 minus 3.11 and that works out to be 8.21 meters of water. I need to convert that to Pascals so we'll just use atmospheric pressure. One atmosphere is 1.01325 times 10 to the 5 newtons per square meter or pascals for every 10.33 meters of water. And that works out to be 80,300 or 8.03 times 10 to the 4 pascals or newtons per square meter which looks to be the same we got by the other method P2. Here we're calling it H2. It's pressure reported as a height of water 8.21 meters and then converted. So you can use whichever method you like on a test. In my reckoning the second form here usually involves fewer calculations. I prefer this one but you can use whatever you wish. Page 104 please. Some new terms here. Liquid heads in fluid flow. We have hydrostatic head, friction head, and velocity head. I'll try and explain them and by the end of the page they'll probably make some sense to you. The vertical depth in feet or meters of any point below the surface of a liquid is called the pressure head or hydrostatic head. It's basically just the pressure at any point below the surface in a fluid and it's called the hydrostatic head. And it's usually expressed in feet or meters of water. You can say I got two feet of hydrostatic head pressure due to two feet of water sitting above me. Recall the formula from the pressure depth equation P equals rho GH or DH. From this equation we can solve for H is equal to pressure over D. Let's just try and get comfortable with these a little bit. Using fresh water as a fluid, calculate the depth of water that would exert a force of one atmosphere. Use the equation above and use pressure and weight density in the British and SI system. Let's try solving this. It's almost facile. It's so simple. But it's just to help us get comfortable with these new terms. Recall that pressure equals rho g h or dh. We use the dh form. We'll rearrange and solve for h which will be the hydrostatic head. is calculated from the pressure of a fluid above a point divided by the weight density of the fluid. Now it's water. Let's try the SI system first. So in the SI system one atmosphere of pressure is 101,325 newtons per square meter or pascals divided by the weight density of water. I don't know if you recall that. It's odd number 9807 newtons per cubic meter. Take a look at the units. Newtons per square meter divided by newtons per cubic meter will be meters. This number comes out to be, not surprisingly, 10.33 meters of water. We know that's equivalent to one atmosphere pressure. We just calculated it. The hydrostatic head that exerts one atmosphere pressure is 10.33 meters of water. We're asked to do it in the British system. H is equal to pressure divided by weight density. In the British system, 2,116 pounds per square foot divided by 62.43 pounds per cubic foot. Now, do you recall where the 2,116 came from? Do you recall that atmospheric pressure is 14.70 pounds per square inch? 
just want to convert that to per square foot from per square inch. Recall there's 144 square inches in a foot. That's 2116 pounds per square foot. All right, so this works out to be, probably again not surprisingly, 33.90 feet of water. At a depth of 33.90 feet, the hydrostatic head is 33.9 feet. It exerts a pressure of one atmosphere, which is 2,116 pounds per square foot. Let's do it in the CGS system since we're here anyway. CGS H is equal to pressure over weight density. In the CGS system we have 1013250 that's 1.013 times 10 to the sixth and that's dynes per square centimeter divided by the weight density of water is 980.7 dynes per square centimeter. This will have units of centimeters and that's 1033 centimeters of water which is really equivalent to 10.33 meters of water. All right, so that's a hydrostatic head is simply the depth of a liquid above a point which is reported as if it were a pressure. It's called the hydrostatic head. What's your pressure? What's your hydrostatic head at a certain depth? Okay, we've got hydrostatic head. Our next term here is friction head. So a drop in pressure will occur in moving water due to friction and it's called a friction head. It's directly proportional to the total area of rubbing surface as well as the roughness of the surface and the velocity of the fluid. Abrupt changes in cross-sectional area or direction of flow will cause increased friction head. We'll talk more about this coming up soon. Friction head. Right. And we also have what's called the velocity head. Recall from Torricelli's theorem that the velocity of a fluid in a pipe is related to the pressure that created it. So if I have pressure stored in a fluid, it's under pressure, it's static, it's not moving. If I open a valve, that pressure goes to zero and it converts to velocity. It's called the velocity head. So here we're calling it H sub V. So it's the velocity head, meaning it's the pressure that will produce a certain velocity h is equal to v squared over 2g. So in other words, a static fluid under pressure would move with a velocity calculated by Torricelli's theorem if a hole or a valve were opened in the side of a pipe or a vessel. If we neglect friction, all the static pressure energy would be converted to velocity. We have a problem here that will help us put these terms in perspective. Now I've drawn it out over here so let's read it while you look at the picture. Water discharges under gravity, meaning under the force of gravity, from an open tank with a very large surface area through a six inch ID pipe. The total depth of water above the opening is 12 inches. As water leaves the pipe, it travels a horizontal distance of 3.45 feet through the air before reaching a pond which is 3.68 feet below. That's all we're given. A. Calculate the actual horizontal velocity of water as it leaves the pipe. How are we going to do that? How do we calculate the actual horizontal velocity? Well, velocity is just distance over time, right? We know the distance is 3.45 feet before it hits the pond. What's the time? I'll, I'll admit this problem is a bit strange, but it, it is good to help us understand what some of these terms mean. For A, calculate the actual horizontal velocity. 
How do we calculate that? Well, V is just distance over time. How far does it travel horizontally? 3.45 feet. How long does it take? How many seconds? We don't really know, do we? It's not given. How are we going to work this out? Well, some basic physics. The same time that it took to travel 3.45 feet horizontally is the same time that it took to fall 3.68 feet vertically. We should be able to calculate that because we know the acceleration is due to gravity. Recall from basic physics, the distance an object travels is V1t plus one-half at squared. So V1 is the initial velocity. In our case, the initial velocity falling is zero. It starts from rest. So this term is conveniently zero. We want to solve this for time. Let's rearrange this a little bit. We'll say t squared is equal to 2 d over a and therefore t is equal to root 2 d over a. In our case we have the root of 2 times the distance that would be 3.68 feet and the acceleration due to gravity recall is 32.2 feet per second squared. And that works out to be 0 0.478 seconds is the time taken for this water to fall 3.68 feet will be the same time as it took to travel horizontally 3.45 feet. We'll divide by 0 0.478 seconds and that works out to be 7 point two two feet per second. So this water is initially at rest. We open the valve. Whatever pressure is there generates a velocity of 7.22 feet per second. Now that's the actual measured velocity. It's not theoretical. That's actual. B says calculate the theoretical velocity of water in the pipe or leaving the pipe. Notice it's going to be a little higher. How do we calculate the theoretical velocity? Theoretical velocity is calculated from Torricelli's theorem. V is equal to root 2 times G times H that's called the velocity head symbol was HV which means that there's pressure in the tank the water static you open the valve the pressure goes to zero and all of that pressure is converted to velocity what would that velocity be two times thirty two point two feet per second squared and the height the hydrostatic head that produced it was one foot. And that works out to be 8.02 feet per second. So theoretically, a hydrostatic head of one foot should produce a velocity, a theoretical velocity, of 8.02 feet per second, but we only got 7.22. Where'd the rest go? That's lost due to friction. Question C. C says calculate the coefficient of velocity. What is that? It's simply the actual velocity divided by the theoretical. It's a dimensionless value. C is the coefficient of velocity. The symbol is C sub V. It's the actual velocity divided by the theoretical. This is going to be a number less than 1. 
in this case it's 7.22 feet per second that was the actual velocity divided by 8.02 feet per second looks out to be 0 0.90 it has no units it's simply saying that the actual velocity is only 90 percent of the theoretical velocity as calculated from Torricelli's theorem let's look at D calculate the actual flow rate of water okay we can do that we have the velocity and we have the diameter of the pipe D Q is equal to A times V now the area is pi d squared over 4 we have a diameter so it's pi and we want to work in feet we're told the diameter is 6 inches so that's half a foot 0 0.5 feet squared over 4 that's the area times the velocity this is the actual velocity is 7.22 feet per second and that works out to be 1.42 cubic feet per second that's the actual flow rate that may not have helped you understand these terms but I think this last part will eventually stick with it E calculate the hydrostatic head HH the velocity head HV and the friction head HF friction head is simply the pressure loss due to friction so to be the hydrostatic head a foot minus the velocity head let's give it a try and it'll seem to make some sense I think we want to calculate hydrostatic head the velocity head and the friction head these are all pressure terms well the hydrostatic head is the depth of water above a point that's going to create a velocity that's simply one foot of water as we said at the beginning the velocity head HV will get it from Torricelli's theorem V squared over 2g right so we have a certain velocity that we actually measured we're not going to use theoretical here on your CY in a minute we'll take the actual velocity V squared over 2g and let's calculate the velocity head that we actually got if you will this is 7.22 feet per second squared over 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared this term works out to be 0 0.81 feet so the pressure we call it velocity head that is calculated to have generated this velocity would be 81 feet of water but we actually had one foot of water pressure the magnitude of velocity we got 7.22 feet per second would equate to only 0.81 feet of pressure so we really should have got more where did the other pressure go to well that pressure that went missing is called the friction head so H sub F is equal to the hydrostatic head minus the velocity head which we found was 1.0 feet of water minus 0 0.81 feet of water is 0 0.19 feet of water pressure was lost due to friction 0.19 and 0.81 makes 1.0 so hydrostatic head is simply a pressure owing to a depth of liquid friction head is the amount of pressure that's lost due to friction and then the velocity head is what pressure you would calculate based on the actual velocity rather than the theoretical velocity and we use Torricelli's theorem but we use the actual velocity I hope that helped put some of those terms in focus bottom of page 104 there's a good point here which we're going to encounter in just a minute so let's read it for all Bernoulli equation calculations use H and Z 
as actual heights, distances, do not factor in the density to calculate an equivalent height of water. So if you're working with concentrated sulfuric acid, concentrated phosphoric acid, benzene, whatever it is that will have a density different than water, don't change the heights of the process fluid to heights of water. Keep every term in the equation as whatever the process fluid is. Just leave it as height of sulfuric acid, height of phosphoric acid, whatever it is. And then when you get your answer, it will be the height of the solution, not water. At the very end, then you can apply a density correction to convert to usual pressure units. We'll show you that in the upcoming examples. Page 105, please. Problem number seven. A pump draws a solution with a specific gravity of 1.84. This is not water. It's denser than water. It's likely sulfuric acid because conch sulfuric acid has this specific gravity. It draws it from a storage tank through a 3 inch ID pipe. I've kind of drawn it here so why don't I have you look at it while I read it. So here's a storage tank. It's being drawn through a 3 inch pipe right down here. The symbol for a pump is the letter P inside a circle. The velocity in the suction line is 3 feet per second. I have it written here, very small. I'll expand it later. The pump discharges through a 2-inch ID pipe to an overhead tank. Notice this pipe is smaller. The pump is discharging through a 2-inch ID pipe into an overhead tank. This is like an open to the atmosphere. It's just discharging freely. The end of the discharge pipe is 50 feet above the level of solution in the feed tank. So we're told the end of the discharge, which is right here, is 50 feet above the level of solution in the feed tank. We're told we have a frictional loss of 10 feet of solution. I'll explain. What pressure must the pump develop in PSI? What is the horsepower of the pump assuming it is 65 percent efficient. So this is the whole enchiladas. We finally got the whole problem and I'll explain as we go. So I've labeled this up. Please just look at it with me for a minute. So we have a certain height of liquid in a tank. It's probably sulfuric acid. We're not told the height of the fluid. It just doesn't say. I just call it X feet. And at point one where it enters the pipe, it said the velocity is 3 feet per second. The diameter is 3 inches. Since this is the lowest point in the system, the elevation is 0. The hydrostatic head or pressure due to the height of the liquid, well, we don't know. We'll just call it x. We must calculate the pressure provided by the pump in PSI, and I'll explain the efficiency part later. It's being pumped through a 2-inch pipe to an overhead discharge tank. I'll call this point 2 where it releases. D2 therefore is 2 inches. We're going to need velocity 2, elevation 2, and we're given this term the head loss or pressure drop due to friction is 10 feet of solution. So to this point we've been ignoring friction and just saying total energy going in is total energy going out. It's not strictly true. There's always a loss of energy due to friction and that would stop the fluid from moving were it not for the fact that we put a pump into the system to offset the frictional losses. We're going to use the form of Bernoulli's equation. The full form, it's back on page 101. It's this equation number 7. H plus Z plus V1 squared over 2G is H plus Z plus V2 squared over TG. That's fine. But here we have a term for pressure that we have to add, additional pressure with a pump to drive the stuff. And then here's the pressure loss due to friction. So we'll have these two additional terms in our calculation. We need to calculate a few things here. What's the elevation at point 2 up here? We don't really know. We just know that it's 50 feet above the level of liquid in the solution. I didn't know what that is, so I called it x. So we'll just say the elevation, we'll call it 50 
feet plus x feet. We'll see that'll work out. We need velocity 2. Velocity 2 is going to be greater than velocity 1 because the pipe is narrower. We can figure that out pretty quickly and easily. V2 will be equal to V1 times the ratio of diameters squared. V1 was 3 feet per second. And we know that V2 is bigger than V1 because the pipe is narrower here. So put the larger diameter over the smaller diameter. That's 3 inch over 2 inch. And we'll square that. This ratio is 1.5. 1 1.5 squared is 2.25. Right? 15 squared is 225. So that's an easy one. 2.25 times 3 feet is 6.75 feet per second. That's V2. I think we're okay now to write out Bernoulli's equation. Let's give it a shot. I'm going to say the pressure of the pump, which we're going to solve for, plus H1, which is the pressure at point 1, plus the elevational potential energy plus V1 squared over 2G will be equal to H2 plus elevation 2 plus V2 squared over 2G plus the head loss or pressure drop due to friction. Remember we're solving for HP here. HP plus what was the hydrostatic head at our initial point? like right down here. Well, we don't know. We just call it x feet. So I'll leave it at x feet. What's the elevation at this lowest point? Lowest point is always 0. The velocity, v1 was given us 3 feet per second. That's 3 feet per second squared over 2 times g, which is 32.2 feet per second squared. Notice how the units cancel to be feet equals h2. What's the hydrostatic head at point 2? Take a look at the diagram. How much liquid, if this is discharging freely into air, what's the pressure above this point? Well, there's nothing. There is no liquid head above this point. This is 0. Elevation 2, what's that? Well, how high is it at point 2? Well, it's 50 feet plus x feet above point 1. That takes care of our x, doesn't it? It's 50 feet plus x feet. That's elevation 2. V2 squared, we worked out that V2 was 6.75 feet per second squared over 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared. And then the pressure drop due to friction, we're given a value of 10 feet of the solution of the liquid that we have. Let's work out some terms here. I have HP, the pressure of the pump, plus, now I can cancel out this x feet, right, because it's on both sides. And I'll cancel out the zeros as well leaves me with HP plus 0 0.14 feet. That's this velocity term. Equals over here 50 feet plus the other velocity term is 0 0.71 feet. And then we have the head loss due to friction is 10 feet. So the pressure of the pump will be 50 plus 0.71 plus 10 minus 0.14 works out to be 60.6 .6 feet and that's not water that's the fluid. Now is the time when we convert this to an equivalent height of water because once we get it in height of water we can then convert to any pressure unit using atmospheric pressure. So we wanted to make a ratio of the two specific gravities. Now keep in mind, this stuff, I'm going to say it's sulfuric acid, is denser than water. So if you want the same pressure, 
using water instead of sulfuric acid, will the column of water be higher or lower than that of the sulfuric acid? Please say higher. It's going to take a higher column of water to exert the same pressure as a lower column of a denser liquid. So put the larger specific gravity, 1.84 sg, divided by the smaller specific gravity, and in the case of water that's 1, so simply multiply by 1.84, tells us that if we were using water instead of sulfuric, we would need 111.4 feet of water to exert the same pressure. All right, so we have the pressure that the pump has to exert. We want the horsepower. Now this is new. We touched on it on the first page and no doubt you've forgotten and that's okay but let me remind you. Power is calculated as pressure times flow. You say what? Let me put some units in. In the British system pressure is pounds per square foot times flow which is cubic feet per second. It gives us cancel out some square feet out of here and you're left with pounds times feet per second. That is force times displacement over time and that is the rate of doing work. That's work over time. In the SI system, it might seem more familiar to you. Let's put the SI system for comparison. Pressure would be newtons per square meter. And then flow would be cubic meters per second. Let's cancel out the square meters. We have newtons times meters per second. A newton times a meter is a joule. Joule per second is a watt. A watt is a unit for power. So now let's actually put some numbers in. We have power equals the pressure. We just worked that out as 111.4 feet of water, but we need it in actual pressure units, which would be pounds per square feet. So we better do that. All right, so we need 111.4 feet of water. We need that in pounds per square feet. We'll use atmospheric pressure. Do you recall there's 2,116 pounds per square feet for every 33.90 feet of fresh water? So our pressure is then 6,955 pounds per square foot. And that's what we use to calculate power is pressure six nine five five pounds per square foot times the flow rate what's the flow rate well we're not given it but we can calculate it right all right let's back up a bit make it some room because we do know a, f a velocity and we also know the area so we have q is equal to a times v and area is pi d squared over four pi i'm going to use the three inch diameter that we were given on the left hand side that's three inches divided by twelve inches per foot I'm working in feet pi d squared over four that's the area times the velocity was three point zero feet per second this works out to be zero point zero four nine one square feet times three feet per second which is 0 0.147 cubic feet per second that's q all right times 0 0.147 cubic feet per second so our power works out to be 10 24 feet pounds per second. That's unit of power. We want that in horsepower. There are 550 foot pounds per second in a horsepower. So it would be one horsepower is 550 foot pounds. So divide by 550, 
that works out to be 1.85 horsepower. That's the size of pump we need. At least that's the rate at which work must be done to lift the fluid against a 10-foot frictional loss. Now there's one last thing we have to do. The question mentioned that the pump is only 65% efficient. So whenever you buy a pump, it's never 100% efficient. It might be 95% efficient. It might be 80% efficient. 60% efficient. There's always slippage within the pump. There's always internal friction, so it will never be 100%. So you'll always want to have to buy a pump whose horsepower is a little more than what you actually need. This value, 1.85, is what we need. That's what's calculated to drive the liquid. But the pump will have to be bigger. It's much the same as when you're trying to weigh out, say, 2 grams of a material, and the reagent you're using is only 90% pure you know you have to weigh out more. You divide by 0.9 right, to account for the fact you have to add extra. In this case the efficiency was given as 65 percent so we have to divide by 0.65. That's for the efficiency. And that gives us a horsepower of 2.86. So you go out and buy a pump with a horsepower rated at 2.86 that's what it draws that's what it draws from the power supply what it actually can deliver in this case is 1.85 horsepower because of internal friction and losses that 1.85 horsepower is sufficient to drive the liquid through the system that we've described that is the whole enchiladas for calculating flow rates and the horsepower of a pump in this industrial flow section and that's enough for today.